Uh, one but last talk of the, the day. Hang on out there. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have Mark here. Yay! <laughs> and uh, he's going to talk about the wonders of logistic bandit. Right? Thank you very much. So, yeah, last talk of the day, I tried to be reasonably not quick. Not last? Not last. Ah, oh, okay. I try to be uh, reasonably quick, and I'm really happy to be here today. So I'm you going have to, talk... to speak up, probably, for people in the back to hear you. Or are you here? Should I use the mic? Maybe you have to use the mic. That works. That works. I don't know. I can touch the mic. Yeah, it works. It works. I need to turn it on. Technology. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. Good. I think it's working. Okay, so I'm going to talk about logistic bandits and uh, in particular the we want to explore how the nonlinearity that is in the reward signal in logistic bandit affect the explore exploit trade. So I'm not going to present you a single paper, but I'll try to give you a quick overview of a series of papers that we did on the topic. Uh, it was uh, done during the PhD of uh, Louis Forin, so one of my PhD students. And uh, okay, so all those papers, they follow up one another and they try to address a different aspect of the problem. So the first one, we well, are mainly going to talk about concentration inequality and confidence sets, so it's going to uh, have a lot of connection with the previous talk. The second one, how to use it to have an optimal algorithm. And the third one is about uh, computational costs. And I'm mainly going to talk about the first two for interest in of time. Uh, okay, so everything has been done hand in hand with uh, with Louis. I'm really invited to him for, for that. Uh, and also the co authors, so Clément Calozen, Olivier Charcock, and Comte. Uh, Okay, so what was the motivation of all this? So we want to do sequential decision making, but we stick to bandit for sake of simplicity. And uh, we want to go towards richer reward model. Okay, so simple game, we submit action to an environment, we receive a reward. We are in the stochastic setting, so here the reward is randomly generated according to the distribution, depend on the action. Okay, and that's it. We want to accumulate as much reward as possible. And okay, as soon as you have a huge number of actions, it's not infinite, okay, you can't go towards which embedded uh, uh, solution, but very likely if you're in this configuration, you have interrelated payoff. So two actions that are similar, they need to they need to similar reward. And the natural way to encode this is to say, okay, let's let's go for a parametric approach, and we assume that the, the expected reward is given by a function of the action, and here the function is parameterized, so we put everything we don't know about the model into a single parameter of step. And depending on, okay, what class of function you choose for F, you can have more or less, you know, complicated reward model. So of course there is a tension, huh? the, the more complicated, the harder it is to say this thing uh, theoretically grounded. So on one side you have linear bandits, it's relatively well understood, maybe limited in terms of uh, expressive power. And on the other side of the, the spectrum, you can think of like a neural bandit where you put a big neural network for the reward function. And uh, okay, it's unclear still to me how to derive switch coherence for this. So we wanted to go towards neural bandits, but we are like uh, very reasonable people. So we decided to do just a one step further linear bandits and shoot for generalized linear bandits. So it's a minimalistic nonlinear extension on top of linear bandits. And so this should was designed to be like the, the appetizer, the, the starter for this PhD. Turns out that we spent the three years on that. And so we stick to generalize linear bandits, no, no neural bandits at all. Okay, so the question in generalized linear bandits is the following. So, as I said, it's a minimalistic nonlinear extension on top of linear bandits. And what we want to know is whether nonlinearity in GLPs is good or bad for the exploration of exploitation trade offs and for the performance. And so, when we started the, the state of the art result, which uh, by state of the art result, I'm mainly thinking of a paper by uh, Sarah Philippi, co authors, including Chaba, uh, it was in 2010. Uh, and if you look at the bound and the result, what it indicates is that basically nonlinearity is harmful for the performance. So the more nonlinear the problem, the harder, the worse the performance. And this has been the status quo for like 10 years. So there has been publication on the topic, but none of which that would question this dependency of this, this uh, impact of nonlinearity. Looking at something else. 
And today I'd like to come with a more, a more new story. So basically, the effect of nonlinearity, they only show them, they only affect the beginning of the trajectory. And, and they may not even be always detrimental. Sometimes it's neutral. But in the long run, the effect of nonlinearity totally vanishes. Okay. And even better, it becomes beneficial for the performance in GLDs. And so the conclusion is it's sharp contrast with the previous one. It's like, okay, no, here in GLDs, nonlinearity is a blessing. So the, the more nonlinear the problem, the better. So this is what I would like to convince you today. Okay, so generalizing our bandits, I'm not going to do a presentation for generalizing our bandits. I'm going to do a presentation for logistic bandits. It's a member within this family. It's a very useful member. What I'm going to say though can be extended to other members of the generalizing our bandit family, all the ones that are self-concordance. And uh, I know that people are working on that here. Uh, but okay, limiting myself to logistic bandit. So logistic bandit is a very simple bandit problem. So each time we submit an action to the environment, we receive the reward. And this reward is randomly generated according to a Bernoulli distribution. So it's a binary reward, so zero is one. And it's a parametric model because the parameter of the Bernoulli is given by the inner product between the action that is embedded in RD and a non parameter theta star. So this is how we encode the fact that we have interrelated pairs. And then you take this inner product and you squash it back to zero one by your logistic function. And this logistic function is what brings linearity into the, the, the reward structure. Okay, so the, you have the, the expression of okay. Yeah, so nonlinear reward model. Okay, let's check and visualize it. So that's the first two moments of the of the reward that you get for a given action. So on the left hand side you have the action sets. So here for this example is the unit L2 ball. The green arrow is the unknown parameter theta star. And each time each time you pick an action here. Yeah. You compute the inner product of the theta star. It's projected on the x-axis here. Yeah. Then you squash it back to zero one. So you get this nice okay, signal signal change. Um, another quantity of interest. So this the expected reward is what uh, we care about for performance, but another quantity of interest is the variance of the reward. Because here it's going to um, it corresponds to the amount of noise that we have for an observation. And this varies with the action in the logistic bandit. So we have like a, a gyroscopic elasticity. But the variance of the reward is also connected to the logistic function because it's the derivative of the logistic function at the inner product. So you see that with this bell, bell shape. So it's a nonlinear model, but we have easy learning. And okay, that's the main reason why we focus on this kind of problem. So we can estimate the unknown parameter theta star by uh, just minimizing the log loss, so minus the log length. And we get an uh, MLE estimate to have to, okay, that we can compute effectively. It's a convex log loss, so we are super happy. So that's that's the nice property about this uh, this logistic band. So let's let's just have a closer look at the reward uh, the rewards the, the reward structure, because depending on the instance of the program so the action set in the parameter we can end up in very different situation of or be face very different logistic bandit problem so suppose for instance that because why because we have basically two regimes when the inner product is close to zero we are in the linear part of the signal okay and when the and we have like a, an amount of noise that we don't the unit and when the inner product is large positively or negatively we're in the tail and the reward signal is super flat and we have almost no noise because the variance vanishes to zero super quickly. So depending on the action sets and the parameter that you have, you may end up in different configuration. So suppose that you have a parameter theta star that is of very, very small norm. So all the inner products will be small and you know, close to zero. And so you're only playing in the linear region of the signal. So you just zoom in the early one there and see what you have. So kind of linear expected reward and a variance that is of, you know, of order unity for all the action. So that's a linear bandit problem. So basically the logistic bandit problem in some configuration is just a linear bandit problem. So it's good to note because it can, okay, serve that as a illustrative example. And also we expect when we are going to move to regret bounds to retrieve at least the one of linear bandits since it's a subcase or at least reduces to linear bandits uh, in some cases. But the more interesting setting is this one. 
So we have like now, if the norm of theta star is large, all the inner product will be large as soon as they are positively or negatively correlated with theta star. And so we are playing in the phase of the symbolic. And so we zoom back and the, the reward signal starts having this sort of uh, heavy side uh, shape. And similarly, the, the noise not looking at the, the Dirac because the, the more we are in the tail, the less we have noise and the more deterministic the problem. Okay, so same problem, different instance, different degrees of nonlinearity. So we need to, to quantify it in terms of a problem dependent constants. So we use really similar things as uh, in the work of PDP. We call it kappa nu. So it depends on the parameter. It depends on the decision on the action sets. And it's given by the ratio between the, so it's a conditional number. The, so the ratio between the largest slope and the smallest one over the range of value that you can uh, reach with your inner product. So the higher slope is capital N nu. It's always uh, at zero. Uh, one, two, one, one, four, something like that. And the smallest slope is in the top, oh, left and right. But, but the, the decisions that can be asymmetric. Here it's a symmetric example, but you can have a more complicated uh, action set. So this gives us a quantum kappa, and kappa measures somehow the degree of nonlinearity of your instance. Okay, if you only play in the linear region of the sigmoid, kappa will be very close to one. That will look like linear bandit. As soon as we start playing the tails, kappa will grow large. And uh, Okay, we do have nonlinearities. And I want to insist that, okay, kappa is a problem dependent constant, but it's a super large problem dependent constant. Okay, it scales exponentially with the norm of theta star. So, for a typical application, you have to think about it at, at least uh, 10 to the 3, but, uh, but it can be even larger than that. And um, my claim is that uh, such big constant, we shouldn't hide it in the view. Okay, so we are going to explicitly try to look at the dependency of this constant. Okay, let's see uh, how this constant translates in, in the, or pops up in the previous bound to understand the, how the impact of nonlinearity was understood. So I'm mainly going to describe the work of Sarah uh, Philippi. So they want to minimize the regrets. So do we? So the regrets is just the difference between what we could have accumulated doing the true parameterization between the optimal action and what we accumulate with our algorithm. And what they prove, what they do is that they provide an optimistic algorithm. Uh, for which they prove a regret bond that's case with discrete of t, we are in the infinite arm setting. So, okay. so they have a discrete of t, and uh, that's expected because this is what we have for linear bandits, and we know that you know, both in coincide. But in front of the discrete of t, we have this constant kappa nu, and, and that's not good. Okay, it's a bit nice. So it means that the more nonlinear we are, the larger the regret, the worse the performance, and that nonlinearity is detrimental. So that's what we want to question. Uh, and to see why we have such dependency, we have to look at the analysis. So it's a, an optimistic algorithm. So it builds on two main ingredients, design of a confidence set. And then once you have a confidence set, you play an action that is greedy with respect to the optimistic parameters. Very simple uh, design. Uh, but let's say the, the definition of the confidence set that you use design of the confidence set will really impact the performance of your algorithm because and the confidence set that, that it's used in the paper is the following the one in the past paper here so it's an ellipsoid that is centered in the current maximum likelihood estimated hat and the shape of the ellipsoid is determined by this matrix vt and for those coming out with uh, linear bandit and we saw it in the previous talk this is the, the design matrix of the regression of the, of the square so basically, this ellipsoid is the one you have for the square. The only difference is that now the radius is boosted by this quantity, one over small n mu, and mu is the smallest slope over your decision set. And one over small n mu is a very large constant connected to kappa. So this means that this algorithm is an inflated version, really inflated version, compared to the one we have for the square. It's large, it means it will lead to aggressive, uh, aggressive exploration, and we will pay it in the regret bar. And from a learning theoretic standpoint, it means that the learning guarantee that we have are always as worse as if we were playing action that bring us very little information, as if we are playing in part of the sigmoid where that are uh, very hard to learn. Okay, so it's uh, and some kind of worst case learning uh, flavor. Okay, so now how does this translate in a regret bound? Again, the, the, the sketch of property is uh, relatively uh, simple and, and neat. So you start with the regrets. You use optimism to move from regrets to uh, 
online prediction error. So this is the difference between what you predict in terms of average reward and what you collect. And this is where you have to connect the error that you, the error that you make in the learning into regrets, okay? And the way it's done in this analysis is to perform a, let's say, a global linearization of the sigmoid function, okay? So if you use the efficiency, you have this concept. And then you have to, to control the difference in your product. You apply the standard machinery, a bit of Cauchy Schwartz to connect it back to the shape of the ellipse, so if the confidence sets. This implies that you have the radius of the confidence set that are set, so the one of the small than you. You have this ratio of constant. This is your constant kappa, and the rest of the term will give you the t squared. Okay, so this is where it comes. So remember that we assume that we do learning as if we were always uh, playing action that, are, that bring very little information, so action in the case. But here it indicates that we pay error, so we translate like the, what, what the error in the learning into error, into prediction error, as if we were always playing action in the linear region of the signal. So learning, we assume that we pay here. When we do the regret analysis, we assume that we pay here, and we pay it uh, twice. Okay? So it's worse of most work uh, analysis. So can, can we do better? Uh, so the claim is yes. And um, to, to have an idea of uh, whether there is room for improvement, we can, we can uh, look at those previous uh, extreme cases. So this configuration for logistic bandits, it's a linear bandit. The current PDP uh, so, uh, bound is accurate. It's the square root of t. Kappa is a four value of t. So far, so good. But now in this region, Okay, kappa is super, super large, and so the regret is supposed to blow up, okay? And if we push it to the limits, okay, let's let, let just pretend that the norm of theta star comes to infinity. So this constant kappa is going to explode exponentially fast, and our problem is going to become a deterministic problem, where the reward function is just a helicity function. And is it that hard to solve? So the answer is no. Because if we have a helicity function for the reward, basically, you can partition the action space, so here the unit volume two, in red, all the arms that are positively correlated with the non parameter associated with reward one is probability one. Okay. And in blue, all the arms that are negatively correlated with the star associated with reward zero. So to have no regrets, all you have to do is to find at least one arm in the red region. And how hard it is, well, not, not that hard, actually. So basically, you can construct a sequence of t plus one arm set if you are in the motion key. They are all, all negatively correlated with one another. And you're sure that at least one of them will be in the red area. So in, in the dimension three, you have these this three arms sets, the three arms, and you're sure that at least one is in the red area. And so you just perform a wrong robin. Once you find an arm with a wrong one, you're done. Regret is equal to D. So there, there's some kind of gap between the two, and it indicates that we can hope for better dependency in Kappa. Uh, how to do this? Well. Optimistic, well, we are going to stick with optimistic algorithm. Optimistic algorithm are really tied to the type of confidence set that you use. We know that we have different area, for, depending on where our action uh, interact with the sigmoid, they are uh, more or less uh, informative. And so we need basically a confidence set that is effective to this reward sensitivity and this signal to noise ratio that is not homogeneous over all the decision sets, okay? Uh, so we need a new confidence set. And then we also need to do a local analysis. So we want to get away from this global linearization that we that are everywhere, everywhere in the analysis. And we want to stay local in the point that we actually select. And this we can do, it thanks to the, the notion of generalized self-concordance by uh, Francis Black in 2010, that allows us to, let's say, bound the second order derivative by the first one, very high level. And this is uh, something that will help us in having an exact uh, Taylor expansion, or let's say. So that's our technical tool. Okay, so let's uh, let's dive in. First, we need a new confidence set. So we want a confidence set that is, uh, uh, let's say, effective to the the signal to noise ratio the, the, that quantifies how many how much information does an action brings to, to the to this. And so this is connected with the reward sensitivity. Reward sensitivity is connected to the, the derivative of the reward function, so mu dot. And the derivative of, of the, the, the sigmoid function is also what governs the variance of the noise. So there is a huge relationship in, between the, 
the, the amount of signal that you get and the noise that you that you suffer. Okay, so we want to take into account of this. And since we want to take into account the variance, we need variance sensitive concentration too. Okay. So we need the new new confidence set. So how to guess it? So yeah, first before proving it, let's guess it. And the way to guess it is to use the asymptotic normality of the maximum relative Okay, so suppose for now that we are under the random design. So all the action are picked at random. And then we know that the maximum likelihood estimate will uh, converge in distribution to a Gaussian that is centered in the non parameter theta star and whose variance is this uh, HT minus one theta star. So it's like the feature or the in inverse feature. Yeah. Never know. But basically, it's the Asian of the locus. Okay. And it's the quantity that is in red uh, above the box. So it looks like the design matrix, but it's now reweighted. Uh, all the outer products are weighted by the reward sensitivity, or something that connects to the variance of the reward at this at, at this specific point, you know, right? in this action area. So if you use the asymptotic normality plus a bit of uh, t square uh, concentration, you can get that the right confidence set or the right measure for the learning is the following one. So you should evaluate the deviation between the estimate and the true parameter in a norm that is weighted by the Asian of the local field. So why is it multiplicative? Is it just Gaussian concentration, right? Yeah. Yeah. Very likely because I can late. Uh, okay. So um, the button on shoe well, lose would be adaptive bits. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Parts, look, we don't know if you must lose, but you seem to lose. Yeah. But there should be other Completely agree. Oh, uh, uh, I don't know. I guess I'm still connected, so you're probably not. I think I am. Okay, so yeah, there is a mistake over here, but anyway, I'm not that you can in this bar. What matters is the way you should quantify the deviation. There is something to note here is that there is no longer some uh, small and new ones, any constant that quantifies, you know, the, the, the degree of preliminary is not really a, a constant. And so we want to prove this, and the challenge is to get away from the asymptotic uh, reasoning. We want to find it by guarantee. And more, more importantly, we don't want to, we want to be able to handle the adaptive design because this is how the, the, the algorithm will operate. Uh, so let's go. So it's about, uh, it's a confidence set construction, so it's about concentration inequality. So that would be the, the, the confidence set that you know, follows this rational. Uh, I'm going to discuss it later. Um, but basically, we want to prove a confidence set, so it's about concentration inequality, so we need to find the martingale. That's the object that's going to concentrate. And in least square, we have a closed form expression for it. Here, uh, we have to be a bit more, a bit more differently with the log loss. Uh, but it follows the same idea, and we just do minor modification on the approach uh, over the approach of uh, T. So what what are the main ingredients? You use the fact that the maximum likelihood estimate is the point of zero gradient, and we have a closed form expression for the gradient right here. This is what we reward so far. We decompose the reward between expectation and zero noise with a binary structure and, and depending on the action. We re-inject it into the gradient, we say it's zero for theta hat t, bit of manipulation, a bit of calorie retention, bit of self concordance and what we get with this, we can control the deviation between these parameters in the norm of interest by the norm of the sum of the noise re-weighted by the direction we've taken along the trajectory. And we want to control the norm of this in HT minus one, so the inverse of the the action of the loss. Okay, so that's the martingale we have to control. So basically, what we need is a self normalized uh, martingale concentration inequality that is uh, variance aware. So we are going to try to redo the SNS proof, but with like a Bernstein like condition. Because we want to take into account the variance. So we prove it in a general setting, slightly general. So SC is just a, like a, a, a the same one together for this square. We assume the action to be bonded. Now we have a noise that is in the risk adaptive, so it's almost surely bonded. Very likely we can replace it with uh, the situation condition. 
the, the, the volumes uh, change over time. Okay, it's GT squared. And uh, HG, the matrix here, it, this is the product variation of this. Okay. So that's the, the general uh, framework. And sorry. Okay, and what we prove, uh, and then the proof follows the, the same uh, path. So the idea is that you build uh, an exponential super martingale. So here you have the martingale, creates its product variation. So you take an exponential of it, it should be a super martingale. You just need to be a bit careful. We don't have some, we don't, we don't want to use uh, some cautionity. So we have to resort to a Bernstein condition instead of, of the equation. It equals a constraint that the scene free variable over here will be, will have to be bounded, it's a bit more technical, but overall you can prove a similar result. So we have our self-normalized concentration inequality. And so we have the confidence bar. So now we have a new confidence set, CT, that we were going to compare with the previous one, PT. If you look at CT, now the deviation in the parameter is controlled in a norm that is uh, weighted by the Asian of the log loss in theta. Okay? Because we want to get rid of the dependency. And this is an improvement in two ways. So first, because we have a better control of the signal to noise ratio. Okay, we already shave off a factor of one over n. So this guy here is not under the square root. Okay, so it's a direct improvement. And as soon as we are going to uh, play in the tail, okay, our concentration is going to be better and better. And there is a second type of improvement is that now this dependency is no longer explicit. Okay, everything is in HT and this adaptive depending on the type of action you selected so far. So if you play in the tails, HT will scale with L mu. If you play in the center of the ellipsoid, so what coincides with a linear bent regime, HT will talk, won't, depend, won't depend on L. So that's that's uh, an adaptivity uh, uh, feature that we will leverage on. But there is a price to pay. Okay, so it is better, but there is a price to pay. And the price to pay is that we no longer have an ellipsoid. Okay, in general, we have this weird uh, patatoid blue shape. Okay, it's really painful to manipulate, even to compute. Uh, it can be non convex, and there is nothing we can do about it. Okay, we want to be tight. Uh, the problem is a bit more linear. We have to complicate it. Complicate it. Let's be reasonable, but uh, we have like a non convex or non ellipsoid on configure set. The only thing that we can do for free is to uh, enforce convexity. So we can relax a bit this confidence set, move from the blue to the red one, and it's just a convex, a convex relaxation of it, and we will pay nothing but constant. Okay. The, then the confidence set has a slightly different structure. It's based on the log loss. Uh, you can do either a different proof for this, either connect the two. Uh, so it's, it's not of a, of a huge interest. Okay. So we have this this. Uh, Tight, but uh, not that convenient to manipulate confidence sets. And let's see how it translates in a better wiggle down. So, what about the algorithm? The algorithm is super simple. Okay. So, you write 20, you compute your maximum likelihood estimate, the confidence sets, you play an optimistic action, receive a reward, augment the data set, and so on and so forth. So there is no warm up, there is nothing. So, this is a really pure algorithm that we need. Okay. And so, now what's, what, what would be the wiggle down? So, it's a Really similar sketch of proof as before. Uh, we are only going to be, try to be a bit more careful in the, the locality of our uh, of the control of the prediction error. So you start with the regrets, you move to the online prediction error, and here we don't want to do a global linearization because if we do so, we are going to lose the fact that in some case error matters, in some case we don't care. Okay? So we want to stay local, and so we are going to move from first order federal expansion to second order federal expansion. Huge improvements. Mm -hmm. uh, but the same to this, you know, the first term is going to scale this new result in this action AT that we selected, and that's going to help a lot. For the second term, okay, we are going to be to, to bound it in a very brutal way, and we are going to recover again some capacity, okay, because we do the same global linearization. Okay? But we don't care because it's a lot term, so it's going to be a second order term. So for now, it's uh, it's it's not important. The first one, however. Is going to be bounded by the square root of t and what we want. So what, what you do is uh, so you apply the same the similar machinery as before. You're going to scale with the sum of the derivative in the inner product that you, you got, and then you need to bound this. The way to bound this is to connect back this quantity to the regress, and in the end you will have like regret bounded by square root of regret plus stuff. 
you solve the, the, the implicit inequality and what you get is this, okay? So now the, the, the bound for the regret is the following. So we have this square root of t as before, but now it's multiplied by square root of new dot, the derivative of the sigma here, taken in the optimal action a star and the optimal part of the delta. So basically new dot is the, the reward sensitivity in the optimal action. And, and then we also have a second order term that's getting this term. Nonlinearity is referred to a second order term. But for the first order term, we have an, an exponential improvement because this new dot, the more of, the more nonlinear the problem, the more you're going to play in the tails, the, 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 the smallest. Okay, and technically this case is one over kappa. So previous bound, exponential of norm of theta star with square of t. New bound, exponential minus norm of theta star with square of t. So can we can we try to 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 make sense of this regret bound? So we have two terms, actually they are connected to two different regimes of the of the, the algorithm, and this also connects with uh, with uh, the implementation. So the first the dominating term coincides with the permanent regrets. Uh, and the permanent regrets kind of quantify what you lose once you have enough information so that you have roughly located the optimal action A star. So at some point you have a pretty good idea where A star is, you know, so over here. This is the, the the red circle, and you only operate in this region. So basically, at, at this moment, you will only pay action in the tail. And for, 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 for no one, what you have is the, the local linear approximation of your reward signal start become very relevant. Okay, so it's expected that you scale with the linear slope of the reward function at this point, which is new that of n star theta. And so the flatter, the smaller the regret. The transitory regret, however, is about how many times it takes you to get there? And, and what was the cost in terms of regrets? And there, it's scaling kappa because, okay, it can be hard to find this region. And here, nonlinearity can, uh, can, uh, can be detrimental. And this we knew it because we have a, a Bayesian lower bar, that in fact, from only 2019, where uh, they show that if the, well, they show that it is, they show that uh, you can, you can pay an arbitrarily large constant uh, in the regrets if you have, uh, if you can put an arbitrary amount of nonlinearity. So it's a slightly different way of approaching the thing, but at least, I mean, this second order term that's case this KMU is, is coherent. We expect this KMU dependency to pop uh, Yeah? Just, just for the intuition, uh, mm -hmm. just because. We see in the flat region you're trying to locate something. Yeah, I'm going to so this next slide is about this right away. So I'm going just to discuss a bit more on this transitory regret. Yeah. So this this second order term, what is about? What you can show is that this transitory regret term is about the number of times you will play action on this what, what we call the detrimental arm sets. And what are the detrimental arms is all the arms that brings you no information and that's super costly in terms of regrets. So you have two arm, two type of arms that brings you no information. The one that are in the left tail and one in the right tail. The one, the one in the right tail is good because they are associated with reward one, so they are very rewarding. But the one in the left tail, they give you reward zero, so they are super costly. So no information, costly in terms of regrets. And how many times it takes you to get out of here? So maybe if you uh, go back to the unit ball action set uh, example, the blue one. Do now all the arms that are in the red region. They bring you very little information about where theta star is, and uh, they are super costly. And the lower one of them uh, plays with this kind of structure. So they construct uh, uh, many, many arms in, in the, the red cone uh, that basically you just have to do a round robin over it before figuring out that they are all bad. And move to uh, to another one that is in the blue region. So why does it all of us? Okay, but although in the case that this can cost you at most kappa, okay, so that's that's uh, that's the thing. Kappa locked in, so there is there are locked in everywhere. Uh, but 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 yes. I guess I see the one over the angle slope thing mm -hmm. here. I'm not necessarily seeing the maximum slope. The copper has two parts, maximum slope slope yeah. divided by minimum slope. The minimum slope, I kind of feel it 
maybe it should be there. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure whether we really need the maximum slope. Technically, for logistic bandit, we don't care at all because it's a numerical constant. It's uh, 0.25. Yeah, it's just one, but... Uh, but uh, ah, sorry. It's my laptop. But okay. uh, uh, yeah, yeah you, maybe for, for some uh, problem in sense, uh, other type of uh, generalized linear model, we should pay a bit more attention right. to this. Uh, yeah. One over any. The, 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 the one that's painful is the is the the minimum. Well, that's the slope is on top, right? So just to go the maximum slopes on in the numerator. Yeah. So yeah. if we constrain ourselves to a shell, it would that ratio be one if we were on a sphere. Uh, sorry, can you say it again? If we're on the sphere, if the answer yeah. was sphere and mm -hmm. not the ball, mm -hmm. would kappa mu always be one? Uh, yes, because uh, even though you're on the sphere, you can take actions that are completely orthogonal to theta star, gives you an inner product of zero, and so the sigmoid will be applied at zero. So ah, you have, yeah, yeah, of course, my bad. Okay. So, yeah, transitory regrets is about detrimental arm, and the question is, uh, okay, uh, how much is it, how much it cost to get away from, I mean, to discriminate this answer, this, this answer. So, in general, our bond says it's kappa, but in many situations, it can be way less. And for instance, when the object is the ball, actually the transitory regret you know, is independent of kappa. This case with, okay, here it's the cube, very likely it's not tight, but uh, okay. the distribution of logistic changes because of the values and then the variable. Most of the generalized linear bandit uh, member will, have, will satisfy this property. The, for those results to hold, basically, uh, beyond logistics, you need uh, so generalized linear model that are self concordant So that you can uh, connect, you know, the derivative, the second order to the first order derivative. So you, allows a, uh, yeah, it allows you to have a fine control uh, when you do tell function. And they are not, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, they are not all self concordant So, Alex, but we but show Alex. Uh, I think if there's Gaussian, you get it. depends on the um, yeah, but tails of are, are the generalized now model that are not subversion. So, so it depends on like force moment. Uh, yeah, so it depends. So, like a sub Gaussian has certain conditions on the fourth moment. Mm -hmm. I kind of say they can't be too far away from the second moment, mm -hmm. and then from there. You really just care about bounding the third moment by the second moment. So if you know your fourth moment is close to your second moment, your third moment must also be close to your second moment. So you're using this problem. So sorry, Alex, do you have a question? Can I, can I just, sorry, uh, just, just to clarify, the fourth moment is bounded no matter the parameters, then you have staff of course. Okay. As it is. But so uh, all the member in the generalized linear model family that don't have this bounded form. Yeah, it's a first one of condition. Okay. But if you have this, then it's going to work exactly the same. Okay, and uh, if you want to have a look, the whole uh, PhD manuscript of we is written, I mean, uh, in general, as general as we can for self concordant uh, generalized linear model. Okay, uh, so yeah, and even for, for, so for specific situations such as, uh, you know, the unit goal or if we have only k arms, for instance, this transitory like that is k, is k or v. Uh, so it can be independent of k and u, but in the worst case, yeah, who knows? And so overall, linearity has no effect or a positive effect on the river bond. Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, so that, that's, that's the claim. Uh, and the next question is, uh, okay, can we do better? And to know whether we can do better, we just need to find a lower bound and ideally a matching one. Okay, so that's, uh, that was the topic of basically the second paper. Uh, I don't know how many time I, I have left. So I'm trying to... Ah, I'm going just to bruise through it quickly. So is this regret uh, bound optimal? And so basically, can we prove a lower bound of this form? So basically, that's case we did it correctly. This, we want that this new does pop up. And uh, this second order term, 
let's see. So what is it challenging? So we want a lower bound that involves problem dependent constants. Okay, so we should pay attention when we choose a hard uh, alternative. And basically, if you look at the the, the band book, uh, and the linear the lower bound proof for linear band it kind of requires that the norm of t theta goes to zero. If we do so, I mean we're interested in a regime where the norm of t theta is supposed to be large. So we have to modify a bit this uh, this reasoning, but it builds on the thing. And uh, and what we follow is a line of proof. Uh, that I found in a, in a paper by Max Nikolic and uh, Dylan uh, in another setting. I don't know if they uh, fully invented it or if they inherited it from another world. But what they do is they, they lower bound the minimax regret. And the minimax regret, the local minimax regret. So, basically, you take a nominal instance theta star, uh, the 16, and you look at the worst case regret in nearby alternatives that are epsilon away from your nominal instance. And since they are only epsilon away from your nominal instance, they are going to share exactly, they are going to share the same problem dependent constants. And that's how you, you connect, you connect it. You recover like uh, the, the proper problem dependent constants. So I'm not going to enter too much into the detail, but okay, this is the result that we proved. If the arm set in the sphere or the ball, uh, Whatever the nominal parameterization you want, uh, it exists a, sm a small uh, neighborhood uh, around this uh, nominal instance such that the minimax regret uh, is lower bounded by this square t square of mu dot. And of course, we have a condition that t has to be large enough because in this result, we completely don't care about the transitory region. So we put ourselves in the permanent regime of the regret and the lower bound is only addressing these parts. Uh, we don't have any lower bound for uh, the transitory regrets. We know that they are not on some instance. It's unclear what should be the dependency. Uh, open question. Uh, but it means that our algorithm previously is uh, is uh, is minimax optimal at least uh, for T big enough. Uh, and just just a bit of discussion. Why? How can we use this minimax regret uh, uh, notion to have a problem dependent constant? Okay, so you fix a nominal model theta star. We pick a nearby hard alternative theta, which has a large regret, okay, that we scale with theta star. But since they are both close, mu dot in a star will be very close to mu dot in the optimal action associated with theta, and you will the result that you Okay, and how does it work? Uh, and this will be my last technical slide. Um, so basically, you, you fix a nominal instance theta star. We assume that you have a policy that behaves well for this, this problem, okay? So it has a sublinear regret, so necessarily it picks action, action that are uh, close to the optimal action in theta star. And as a result, there is a whole part of the space that is left unexplored. Okay, so it's the, the hyperplan, the orthogonal hyperplan H. Yeah. And now within this space, we want to find a nearby alternative that the algorithm couldn't distinguish. So basically, all the parallelization in the blue one would have been potential uh, transitors that would have generated the data. <clears throat> okay, so the, the, the algorithm is not able to discriminate between the two. And all, all you have to do is to find within this group region a nearby alternative that is uh, as plausible but has a very different optimal action. So that's, I mean, if the algorithm ends up in this configuration, it will, it will, uh, it will uh, suffer a lot of regret. Uh, and this is that you trade off the two, and you do all this by being a bit careful about, uh, again, trying to have a local approach to have all the, the, the let's say, the local sensitivity analysis, and you recover what, what you want. So that's it uh, on a statistical and uh, tightness perspective. The last question is about uh, having efficient algorithm for, for those, uh, those problems. I'm going just to give you the pitch and, and then I'll conclude. So, if you think about what we did from a regret bound point of view, exploration, exploitation, exploration, exploitation trade off point of view, logistic bandit and linear bandit, well, they are the same. They are the same because at some point you are going to behave on a very located area and the local linearization is here. But from a computational perspective, they are definitely not the same. For the linear bandit, but for the planning, you can you can maintain online all the confidence set. You have a recursive formula for the least squares. It's, it's very nice. For the logistic bandit, at each time step, you have to minimize the log likelihood. So you have to do a linear pass on the data. And then you have to maintain this patatoid uh, shape uh, confidence sets. 
cost at least uh, the go of d square t per round. Okay, so that's super completion expensive, and you can't run it on your laptop, which is very annoying. So can we make it uh, computationally efficient, and then you know really have a logistic bandit algorithm and analysis that are similar to the one of network bandits? So that was the the purpose of the last paper, and the answer is uh, yes. So we resort to some sort of online Newton step method, which I'm not going to describe here. We have a slightly different confidence set that we can maintain online. And uh, the only drawback is that now we have to resort with, to a one-up phase that would be our size kappa, because this is only valid when we are in the permanent region. And that's the, let's say, the not elegant part, the non-elegant part of the algorithm. Uh, and yes, so some, some uh, just uh, synthetic experiments just to support one point. So remember that kappa is a constant, but it's super hard. So when you do numerical experiments, actually you, all you see is linear regress. Okay, all these algorithms are black, red, and orange. They are so linear bounds, but you will never see it. Okay, if you take kappa to be 10 to the 3, you have to have t greater than 10 to the 6. No, you won't do this. Yeah. So we will need to clear that constant, and the blue and the red one are the two algorithms, so the non-efficient and the efficient one. Of course, we lose a bit by trying to improve efficiency. Okay, so the, the, the efficient algorithm, the blue one, and the bit above the red one, but they have exactly the same scaling. They don't have the same uh, computational complexity. Okay, so uh, the, the pure OFU-like uh, algorithm, the green one, so it's T-squared at least, it's a, it's a lot, uh, whereas uh, we can kind of similar uh, performance with the blue one that's getting in, in terms of computational power. So yeah, that's it. So moving from uh, GLM and CD, uh, that depends linearly on kappa, to the uh, optimistic algorithm that puts kappa to the denominator, and we arrive with the different findings in of linearity, and then to uh, equalize the, let's say, a computationally efficient counterpart of it. And in the end, we have an algorithm that is minimax and efficient. There is only one thing, no, there is one thing that we did not uh, really look at, and that is quite important, I guess, is about the second order term. So the second order term, we know it does not exist in some cases. We know it's bad in other instances. What is the right scale? What is the right uh, dependency in the, in the problem, uh, in the instance? Difficult question. It's difficult to, uh, to to have a unified answer without you know doing some case by case analysis, uh, very adapted to the setting. But uh, okay, open question. And and what what would be the, the dependency? The worst case dependency in kappa is also an open question. Right now we have kappa. My guess is that it's log kappa, but it's just an intuitive guess. That's it. Thanks a lot. So I'm going to change the work in the confidence and mm -hmm. despite the confidence and bias. Uh, can you do something similar to solve the problem this time? So, so the previous talk? Yeah, I, I don't know, but yeah, it seems heavily connected. You said that we don't have the same concentration inequality. So it's also Bernstein, also based on Bernstein condition. But I, so we know, we know the, we know the the variance, huh? at least uh, the so if the concentration results, we assume that uh, yes, the variance of the noise is not okay. The fact is that in our case, this is going to scale with theta star, and then we, we put theta star as a free yeah a free variable. You see in the okay. you see here. Then we know that. This inequality holds for theta equal to theta star, and then you know, it has to hold for any theta that satisfies the same. So it's a bit different, but it's good that the concentration inequality that we have is different. Okay, we don't have this uh, this upper bound on the variance, and uh, and we do completely re we rewrite the design matrix with the variance at some step in the action that we take. So maybe they may I don't know if it's all the same, but it may uh, sense. Actually, it's somewhat complicated to explain, but uh, if you look at just like how you are evading, you're multiplying with the variance, they were dividing with the variance. Uh, I know why there is a difference. Uh, 
But yeah, it's it's kind of curious. Like you look at the first time, it might be very surprising. This new dot is not really good variance in your case. It just comes from the non inherity as, as you explained, you were taking very what is. It happens to be the variance. Yeah, yeah. Well, there is but a bit of magic here. The non -inherity. And it's it's somehow it's just working with the model loss, working carefully with the log loss. So this comes up. There is a little magic here in the sense that uh, we can connect the deviation with this quantity that turns out to be the variance. But then from a concentration perspective, it's just the variance. I mean, the, the second result is stated, you know, just for, uh, you know, self-normalized material. I mean, I'm going to imply in this case, but I mean, you can, you can forget about the last line. And just, uh, just apply the concentration for, uh, for uh, heteroskeletic heteros noise. But there is a lot of magic in there. It's, it's, it's like a lot of coincidences going on in this logistic value. I see that that's, yeah. that's what's happening, yeah. partly. So if you're trying to extend it to some, uh, the generally, there are some issues that need to be taken care of. It yeah, here. But yeah, it can, it can work. Uh, yeah. Well, I did have a question about the green line and, uh, yeah, the experiments, uh -huh. non efficient target though. Because um, I'm thinking that maybe if you run the non efficient target in a lazy fashion, you know, like you know, the optimize, blah, blah, blah. That you can, yeah, you can. Uh, it's, the, going move huh? it's going to be T of T. But it's unfair. Do you mean if I put a lazy edit scheme on top of that? No. Yeah, I'm curious whether. There is some way of even doing that. So even though it seems that you would need to re-optimize from start, you could use warm start. I don't know, like some will amortize the cost yeah. over time. Uh, so I was wondering how you were actually running this experiment to get the green curve. So um it's very really unpleasant. Uh, so first thing, okay. definitely we can do lazy updates. So we know that in those bands problem, we don't have to uh, change our action that we play. That's what change trick, right? we, like could, we could do, you know, uh, double off, pay, off and then, the, yeah, okay, so okay. this C square will become T of T. Yeah. But if we start doing this for this one, okay, we can do it for this one. And for this one, I mean, this lazy update yeah. scheme, it's, uh, so now I just want to compare them uh, in a fair way. So it's I no one has that, 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 Loading there, uh, but there is this other laziness that uh, you can just and, amortize. And yeah, 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 this, is, this is what we do. This is what we, I think those curves are. It's already amortizing. So but, but, but yes, of course, we do like, long start. We start from the previous, uh, yeah, yeah. the previous estimate. That uh, you know, you want uh, one There's of some stopping conditions. That yeah, you need to but you have one of the squares of t accuracy that is needed. And we wanted to stay as close as what the theory recommends. Yeah. So you can, you can, you can. I'm, I'm really curious about that. Yeah. But it's very long. And also, this is also why, uh, you know, T stop at 3000. Because after T is equal to 3000, you know, the laptop dies. <laughs> so, and we don't, we, I mean, those are simple uh, problem. Uh, we don't want to use like a whole machinery yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, in terms of computational problem yeah. just to just to go from synthetic experiments. Okay. Okay. Yes.